welcome to Check It Out Comrade, an indie game podcast where every two weeks we bring you two indie games and tell you what we like about them. I'm Nick Lobber. I'm Gary Butterfield. And this week we're doing The Howler and 80 Days. It, it is our aviation suite. Yeah, and they're they're both uh, also mobile games that are available on Steam as well. So Yeah, and it's a nice object lesson between those two things about what is a mobile game that makes sense on Steam. <laughs> and what right? is a mobile game that makes a little bit less sense on Steam? <laughs> yeah, this is a, this is a cautionary tale about adaptation. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, uh, we're we're back after after a little bit of a uh, vacay time, but mm-hmm. uh, kicking off with some uh, with some of these shorter games. We'll have a little bit of longer stuff of some cheap games that we picked up in the recent sale um, next week, and then uh, I think another episode that we're still planning, and then we're going to do a big episode on The Witcher Three. The Witcher Three, which uh, kind of qualifies. Kind of for, for the uh, for the conceit, but uh, we both want an excuse to play it. Yeah, and uh, it, it you know it has um it is not strictly an indie game by any means, but it also has kind of this weird you know CD Projekt Red has that kind of like origin. Yep, as uh, being uh, an also ran, you mm-hmm. know, as opposed to the kind of big studio. So yeah, and and they're an indie publisher themselves. So yeah, uh, and GOG, you know, so yeah, and it's uh the uh you know every once in a while watch out for fireballs does new games. Uh-huh. Every once in a while, we do AAA we'll, do, uh, we'll, do, we'll do triple A game with your uh, <laughs> kind of experiences, just every very occasionally. Yeah, um, right. and, and for when people ask, because uh, people asked when we talked about doing this, uh, this does not mean that someday way off in the future we might do Witcher three for Watch Out for Fireballs too. Uh, if we if we may end up doing like a beat by beat breakdown book club style podcast about it um, in a couple of years, yeah, this does not preclude that. No, and that I mean that's happened with other podcasts too. We've covered stuff that's got and end, ended up on um bonfire you know, side on chat. bonfire side chat. So yeah, um, yeah, I, I think that and that's... well again, like Momodora is going to be in the off season. So right, right, um, yeah. There are so, different different uh, levels of examination. So exactly, in in different contexts, like yep. this is just uh, was it good? Do you, should should you play it? So, yes. Uh, and that'll be your preview into a couple years from now when uh, they talk about how amazing every little mission is because because that'll be a a five episode breakdown of every yeah. side quest <laughs> it will be a nightmare <laughs> um the, uh so uh let's talk about uh let's talk about the howler okay um, um yeah so the howler um it's it's available on steam as i said but it's also available on uh on the i the apple app store and not on the android store but on the amazon store that you can buy for that or that you can get for android which is weird um but it is a uh it's essentially, you know, one of those, uh, it's a very classic game genre where you're just trying to land, like Moonlander style game, except the kind of tweak to this one is, well, it's got a cool painterly art style and you control it with your voice. Yes. Um, which when you do that, uh, it only, I think it only really works as a game when you're doing that. And even then it feels a little like, so what you're doing is you're controlling the, uh, the ascent of a mm-hmm. balloon. Um, you only control the vertical axis Correct. of your balloon. Uh, wind determines the other things, and you're given a kind of increasingly uh, complex task. So uh, land in specific areas, make it over this obstacle, uh, pick up objects, drop them uh, in different places. And mm-hmm. uh, you can only control the up and down, and you just have little arrows that determine which way the wind is going. Right. Uh, when you're controlling this with your voice, uh, which I didn't do on Steam, does does Steam have microphone control? I, yeah, right. you can enable it. Okay. It's not enabled by default, but you can enable it if you have a microphone set up. Okay. Uh, I played it with my phone using my voice because I didn't realize uh, that, it, that it could do, do it both ways. But I did it with my phone. And the idea being, I think, is that it leads to these kind of situations where you are louder than you want to be uh, in order out of desperation. Yeah, from the anxiousness. It makes you kind of, oh, 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 yeah, oh. you're about to you're about to hit something and you go, ah, you know, and start right. yelling at your phone <laughs> um, is kind of the hook. And that that's pretty much all of the hook. That is that is the entirety of the hook, other than kind of its attractive art style, <laughs> yeah. and and music, and it also is tied into this weird science fiction book uh, that you can get uh, on Amazon. That is a four hundred page uh, thing called Hour of the Wolf. Oh, uh, Hour I wasn't of the even Wolf, aware of this. The Steam and Stone Saga book one. Um, so this is this is a, a game that is part of like a multimedia kind of push. You know? Okay, and that is the uh, the most steampunk looking thing I've ever seen in my life. Um, mm-hmm. The author 
uh, is the most steampunk punk looking guy I've ever seen in my life. Uh, it is the most steampunk thing. Oh, wow. Yeah, he, wow. he's incredible. There's two pictures. Make sure you see the other one, too. Um, he's pretty incredible. Uh, so there, there's not... Uh, I think the idea being is that when you're playing the game, you're doing missions that are uh, in the book, but you just don't have the context. Keep calling them missions, like mission complete. Uh, right. Or, and, uh, but... I found this game uh, to be, even when I was playing with my voice, which gave me a little bit of, uh, you know, uniqueness and kind of fun to it. Right. I found it too simple to really enjoy. Yeah, it, it's very basic. Um, and yeah, like I said, it's it's the actual base mechanics, aside from being controlled with your voice, are something that's been explored for forever. Like I was playing Lunar Lander stuff on Apple II in elementary school. So, um, you know, there's nothing super new there you're just i i mean maybe dropping off packages but i'm sure that's been that's done been done before well. too like there's nothing the the entirety of the hook is this idea of controlling it with your voice and yeah. it reminds me a lot of um seeing like tweets and stuff from people doing uh oculus dev where mm-hmm. it's like there's a like oh what if you could do it this like what is this weird new input method for this thing and it kind of comes off more as a novelty than a game right. to me like it's novel to control this thing with your voice but doesn't actually is not actually that fun right you know and it, it kind of strikes me like that or when you go to these like game jams there's a lot of these things where it's like this is a neat idea to control this but, in this weird yeah. way but it doesn't it's not anything more than just a neat idea it doesn't yeah it doesn't carry any weight beyond yeah i've experienced it once and i've got it now it's over yeah it, it just ends up being not super fun right um and that's kind of how i feel about our of uh the howler is that like kind of a neat idea not actually very fun to play and the reason it's not very fun to play is you spend so much goddamn time waiting in this game for your (laughs) really really slow hot air balloon to like drift on these currents yeah if you if you miss like a a, a rise and you just have to like go up and wait for your balloon to go all the way back yep yeah, that's, yeah, that's we're, we're talking. I'm sure we're talking about the same stage. It's like the fourth or fifth stage where like yep. <laughs> you have to uh, you have to go over a spiked kind of steeple. Um, the wind above the steeple is pushing away, you know, pushing you back. The wind below the steeple spike is pushing you forward. So you have to use that forward momentum of the lower altitude to kind of leap over the spike. Right. Um, but if you don't quite get over it, uh, you have to go up into the upper altitude and just slowly make your way back to the beginning of the screen uh, and just... You know, I have very limited patience for the number of times I want to do that. Uh, It's like two or three, you know, at most. And I know that as the game gets more complicated, you know, you're doing more of these things that I just can't imagine the fail states not just getting more and more infuriating as you go. Absolutely. So kind of a bummer. Like, uh, I recommend it. I'll take the heat for this. I recommended this for (laughs) the show because uh, I realized I already bought it. I must have bought it when it was like nearly free on Steam. Yeah, it gets down to like 50 cents. And it got really good reviews. And I was like, oh, this aesthetically kind of looks similar, you know, to uh, it's a it's a kind of steampunky because these are both these are this is like our aviation and then also our like steampunk. Right. And special. I'm like, oh, it's another steampunk game. This might pair well with 80 days and it looks arcadey and simple. Uh, so, you know, something where I'm going to play spend a lot of time playing our 80 days. I don't want to spend another, you know, I wanted a potatoes game. Right. Uh, which it is. It is, yeah. And, and I think that, you know, I didn't finish it, neither did you, but from my understanding, it's about maybe 30 minutes to an hour of total gameplay anyway, so. Even with, like, doing things over and over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, it is uh, It is a super, you know, so yeah, it is, uh, this, this Hour of the Wolf, this thing is transmedia storytelling. So the, uh, I think that the game, as you go further into it, does have reveals that are important to the book. Could be, yeah. Um, but yeah, eventually they want to do an a animated series, a webcomic series. <laughs> Um, and other multimedia platforms that are interestingly enough that's also the witcher is a book and game series well that, that's more of a straight like it didn't come out to say like hey this game is supplementing the book no the game adapts books that already exist this was right. like they both were made at the same time to yeah that is weird this is similar to um the uh, uh richard donner or not richard donner the guy who did uh Donnie darko his follow-up movie um <laughs> south, southland tales which also was a three-part thing. It was supposed to be the movie, the comic, and a, a book that never, or a web series, one of which never really came out. I think. Oh, weird. Yeah, and to get the the whole story, this is very similar to that. Yeah. So, so that's the that's the howler. Let's move on to uh, the much better game of the two. Yeah. Eighty days. Yeah. This this is and this is a great game. It's fantastic. Time Magazine's game of the year in uh, two thousand fourteen. It, it it says it everywhere. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so as you would assume by by that. Uh, 
that title. It came out in, in 2014 um, on iOS, Android, and uh, in 2015 came out on Windows and OS X. And um, it is essentially a uh, interactive fiction game with uh, a lot, you know, there's a lot of graphical elements to it too, but primarily it is essentially the best choose your own adventure that's ever been. It's, it's, um, re- it's really good. I don't, it's I, really I, I won't good. go as far quite that far, but it's uh it's really, really great. It's an original Inkle is the company that made it, which are mm-hmm. the people who did the adaptations of the uh, sorcery games, right? which are, which are fantastic. Um, Inkle also has a interactive fiction engine that they made, um, which is really great. So it's a really cool company kind of company to watch uh, here. And uh, this is their first kind of original work, even if it is not wholly original, right? It is uh, largely original. And uh, I'm really, I'd played it before, but I, uh, gave up maybe, you know, partway through. And I was really happy to have an excuse to kind of push through. Yeah. And it is a choose your own adventure where like the, uh, so we, we'll get into, let's get into the mechanics and stuff because yeah. it's more than just a choose your own adventure. No, definitely. So primarily, I mean, the, the, as, as Gary was alluding to, it is uh, primarily based off of around the world in 80 days, as you would assume from the, from the title, but it also takes on the same sort of uh, Jules Verne, uh, steampunk aesthetic kind of taking that to the next level too but you start off uh, as i believe the story does i've never read it but from my understanding uh you are playing as pespertout or however you pronounce his name mm-hmm. um and he uh helping to lead around uh the very wealthy phileas fog on his trip around the world his bet to get around the world in 80 days um and then from there uh, after you get to paris um essentially from that point it is all about finding routes and uh, going around whichever way you wish to traverse as you have different kind of abilities to get to different cities from where you're at, but you just have to get around it. You can go, uh, you know, upper Asian, uh, upper Asia con- continent and take the uh, Trans-Siberian Railroad, or you can follow along the coast there. You could, uh, I believe, even go up straight north out of, uh, out of Paris and try and make your way th- around the world the other direction. Um, But along the way, there's sort of adventures in every little city um, where primarily you're just picking choices to advance a story as you're exploring the city to try and discover new routes. And there's also a mechanic for uh, purchasing and selling items, which will help you um, on some of these quests or uh, as sort of bargaining chips in, in various different sorts or just as a means of keeping funds around. Because as you'll uh, be uh, alluded to uh, many times throughout the game, object that you buy in one city can be worth a lot more money somewhere else. You can make money by attempting to travel towards that direction. Yeah. You also have access to Phileas's uh, funds as well, but that is a time tax. You have to you go to the bank and wait a certain amount of days in order to uh, withdraw a certain amount of money to help you continue on the, the path. Yeah, th- there's a, there's kind of different gameplay modes. So it, and on one level, um, it is uh, a routing game like you are like you said you're you're trying to find the most efficient route to get you through there's this light economic sim you know of this trading thing and just keeping enough money to keep yourself soluble uh, because even routing costs money like these train tickets and stuff aren't gonna pay themselves and Mm -hmm. then there is like a happiness sim kind of thing because different routes maybe are quicker but they are less comfortable Yes. And you buy and sell equipment that will make you more equipped to uh, deal with these different forms of travel to keep because ultimately you are a valet like you right. are you are uh, Fog's man, you know, mm-hmm. his is uh, his manservant. His, yes. And, and you are uh, his his comfort is is, you know, paramount to you. Yeah. So yeah. those are the simulation aspects that are the skeleton uh, that these little short stories are kind of hung on. Right. Uh, where you stop in a town and you can, it's up to you how much trouble you want to get in. And you can do this game like more or less just treating it as a straight, you know, get around the world and get around mm-hmm. the world fairly quickly. If you take no, uh, no, you know, opportunities to kind of stop and, and smell the sights or whatever. Right. Smell, or, or, or see the smells, smells. or however that expression goes. Right. Um, but the game uh, encourages you not to do that. It really wants you to, one of the things that I think is remarkable and kind of beautiful about it is is uh, it is comes from such a place of uh, wonder and curiosity about the world. Yeah. Um, it is uh, the perspective this game is trying to ingrain in the player is one where uh, the world is a wonderful place. It is full of, of magic and it deserves like these things deserve your attention. Absolutely. That is trying to catch this like kind of, the, and that's the original book is kind of written in that too. Like that is a Jules Verne kind of thing, but this just amps it up to 11. Mm-hmm. You know, this idea that like, no, like, this is this stuff is remarkable. 
Like, you know, when an old English person like drops their monocle and goes remarkable, like <laughs> this game is trying to sell you like, no, it's actually remarkable. It's not right. a, you know, it's not, it's not a joke. And uh, the, the kind of the stories influence each other, you know, like mm-hmm. you kind of get exposed to these different, um, not factions, but different kinds of concerns right. uh, as you, uh, as you go through the world. Um, there's this kind of tension between uh, artificers, like these people who are making these clockwork automatons mm-hmm. and uh, Luddites who don't want that uh, to be, to continue. There are different economic situations in every kind of city and country you go to. And it, it can't be uh, overstated the number of like routes you can take. If there's an incredible amount, like, Every major city is on this map and every major city has something to do and some story to be told. Yes. You know, and, and just going there and seeing these little stories and getting wrapped up in this kind of intrigue uh, that these people, these, you know, in their lives is really, really compelling and great. Uh, I played through it twice uh, for the show. And mm-hmm. the first time I played through it, I ended up staying up until like 530 because I was <laughs> racing against the clock to see if I would make it because it's it does a really good job of like tension like the first time i made it around the world i made it around the world in like 78 days i my first one was 84 yeah Yeah. like it's i don't know how they managed to pace it out so perfectly but i think i mean i i have some suspicions about that i think it has to do with um at least partly with travel uh being much more expensive when you get to america yeah so you're encouraged to wait so they have this kind of uh this system where it's like you may come into it and think, oh, it took me, I got halfway around the world in 40 days, I'm fine. But all of a sudden the money is going to start running out. So you end up having to to wait and withdraw money from the bank. Right. Yeah. Often. Money definitely becomes, money is a bigger factor in the Americas, but travel is a much, e- like getting across wide, wide swaths is a much easier um, thing yeah. to do. So. You, know, you end up taking a lot shorter trips. So if you're like in a city and like you just go to another city in America um, and you have to wait a day. You maybe don't make that much geographic progress, right? You know, so it is. Uh, there are a lot of different factors you're kind of uh, working out there. Um, both times I made it, and both times I got kind of a standard ending, uh, which is just like a celebration that you made it. Um, but one of the coolest things, and I haven't looked up very much about this. I need to look at the wiki. Um, but there is a really, really rare ending, apparently, that only eight people have seen. What have gotten to? I, that's incredible i love that like <laughs> if you can do something that hidden like in a video game i fucking love it like other people have probably seen it like on youtube or whatever but eight people have like done the uh the things the required steps. yeah yeah and then maybe you know that's at the time this wikipedia was written it's possible right. that has changed uh as more people looked up on the wiki how to actually do that right um but that's that's fantastic you know that kind of like level of detail it also states on the wiki too that in you know one one game circumnavigating the world once you will likely most players will see approximately two percent of the total text that is in this available yeah. in this game. It is That's it's incredible. Just, yeah, it's a triumph. That's so like good. the woman who wrote this is a woman named uh, Meg Jayanth, um, <laughs> who mostly just like wrote for the Guardian and stuff like that before this. Like this is her first uh, kind of novel or game. Mm-hmm. Uh, really, really impressive. It's super impressive. Like, and it's it's been recognized. Like, we're not you know we're late to this party. We're oh, not early great. to yeah. it. Two um, two years late. Yeah, but it is it is just it's phenomenal. Like, what a cool game. It, it's really good. What a cool, like, work and cool kind of triumph of, so, of games and, and interactive fiction. I mean, I, I don't remember uh, specific locations or names, but uh, do you want to give go into a couple of general, like, cool scenarios you got into or cool things you saw um, yeah, I on mean, your routes? Yeah, and also just to kind of compare notes, because uh, did you run into uh, the giant mechanical bird thing that, like, swipes you up and brings you up to a building and threatens you? No. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Did you get captured by pirates in a flying airship as you were driving a car? No. No. <laughs> that's so cool. It's so good. Um, I really want to know the bird uh, is crazy because it's uh, it you know it threatens you and says like hey don't uh, don't take this one route. Um, but that route was the fastest. You know, oh. best way to go. So I went, and my guy is just like, I wonder if it was just an empty threat, and nothing ever came of it. But I'm sure there's more with that fucking mechanical <laughs> bird. <laughs> yeah, this game doesn't feel like it leaves any, uh, you know, ends untied. It, yeah. I'm pretty sure that uh, there's something to be found in every which way you go. Uh, if not, they definitely uh, put in the feeling of that, which yeah. is almost as good. So Yeah, that, that's still really important to feel like every single choice you make, every little, like, there's tons of things under the rocks, you know, if you look around. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, at one point I got captured up by pirates and managed to smooth talk the, uh, the female leader of the pirates, I believe, 
who ended up telling me about uh, this artificer who she used to be close friends with and hasn't talked with in a long time and gave me um, a gem, like, you know, one of the artificer gems uh, that are used in their automatons and asked me to take it to him. And uh, and I think I managed to just barely make it, but the guy was pretty hush-hush about the whole thing. But it was cool that I had to, like, go through this whole thing of, like, talk. she swiped me up. She really just wanted to take the car uh, that we were in. So she wanted to steal that from me, but I uh, managed to smooth talk her enough to to get her to, to open up to me and uh, ask a favor of me. And uh, and that was a, one of the really cool bits, right, kind of in the middle of my run. Mm. Yeah, I'm trying to think of a other, like, that was definitely the craziest thing that I saw. Um, a lot of, like, that, that feeling of uh, there being stories around you. Um, yeah. You run into a lot of other people traveling, um, several of them like incognito or um, I exposed a couple or didn't expose, but saw a couple people who were like stowing away. Um, one of which was like a uh, Indian princess. I, I got that one too. Yeah. Um, and I think that one, from my understanding, I think I like Google the name or something. Um, I believe that's actually part of the actual story. So we actually caught some of the book storyline um, route right mm. there. That's yeah. That's I was I was really curious as to what this would be like to somebody who has read uh, the actual Around the World in Eighty Days. Yeah, um, it almost makes me want to read it because it actually sets up a really cool world. Yeah, yeah. I wonder how much of it because I think this exaggerates the steampunk elements. I'm sure. It. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I am, does make me more curious about it, um, or at the very least, like I'll hunt down a movie or something. Right. Um, you know, something something a little bit easier to digest, but uh, really impressive. And just that feeling of like loving care and detail in everything, Mm -hmm. you know, um, one of the, my favorite, uh, little like touches is getting the, uh, uh, the items that are situationally useful, but not trade items. Right. Like where it's like, Oh, cigars, like of, of interest to soldiers and lowborn types. Uh huh. Or, uh, I got um, a set of dominoes. And then uh, because I had dominoes uh, after I found someone's dog, because you end up finding a lot of dogs, that encounter triggered (laughs) a few times. I don't know why. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I got that too. uh, But I ended up playing dominoes with a guy. And because I played dominoes with him, he told me of this like secret boat that was leaving. Uh, There's like a different route. So like the way these things play into each other, the way you're rewarded for exploring uh, is really impressive. And just uh, it is it is a really, really phenomenal kind of experience. The one that I recommend uh, wholeheartedly. Yeah, um, it, and the fact that it is built for the mobile, for, like it's available on Steam, like we said, but I played it on, <laughs> on mobile and it plays just fine. And it, that's a great format for it because you can stop at any time and it's just, you know, just like you had a book in your pocket, mm-hmm. but one that you can choose all your routes and it has this whole deeper layer of Easter eggy, cool exploration stuff. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, it is. It is a wonderful. It deserved all the awards it got for a mobile game. One hundred percent. Yeah, and uh, and it would still play well on Steam. But I would. I liked playing it on my phone quite a bit too. Playing it before bed, even though that led to me staying up like way too late. Um, <laughs> I love the way that uh, Passparto is. Uh, uh, and I'm also probably mispronouncing that, but yeah, I don't know. The way he was characterized as like, you you can kind of so the way when I was talking about the optimism uh, in the tone. It, the game lets you uh it's not you don't just make choices you also dictate what's happening in the world and mm-hmm. um, in a way that reminds me of like tabletop uh certain tabletop games that have player controlled agency where you can get up in a city and you could be like you know i walk through the city streets and then you have two options and it's like the people were rioting or uh there were revels you know revelers about or there were uh you know, even sometimes it's not even that down to that perspective. Like it'd be like, oh, and the 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 uh, the people were rioting, or um, art festooned every you know every available surface. Yeah, you know? that's really good. And you and you just get to choose not only like your own character, but also the kind of world that you're presented with. Uh, but both of which, even when there are people rioting, like you have an op- it is still wondrous and and kind to the individuals yeah in this like it is still like you know then you can grab somebody ask what they're complaining about and then you run away from the cops and you end up in a cafe uh you know talking about the the regime and stuff like that like it just it it, i think this expresses even though like you know i don't know if it's the best interactive fiction game of all time i think it does express like a certain kind of high adventure uh better than any piece of fiction that i can think of yeah like the, the real swashbuckling kind of like barely making it out like British gentlemanly adventure. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and you point, you touched on the, the point too, that there seems to be a huge amount of just like optimism and, and wellness towards everybody. Like no matter what situation anyone's in, I don't think I talked to anyone 
who was ultimately wholly uh, villainous. Yeah. Like, everyone is a person who is doing things for a reason. And uh, and even when it's something, you know, like piracy or any of the sort of shadier stuff, they're not terrible people. They've just chosen a grayer shade than you have, a darker shade of gray. And I, and I think you can die in this game, but I never really felt threatened. No. You know, particularly, like, I always felt like um i could reason my way out of this stuff which is a very like of that time you know pip pip kind of british uh <laughs> yeah. you know perspective uh, on these things that i i just really enjoyed you know no no yeah. villains no no monsters or anything it's just in- people dealing with institutions which is uh that's a good drop backdrop for a story you know that's realistic yeah. so so really fantastic stuff yeah another thing you kind of have agency over in, in that vein too is uh sort of the the personality of of Passporto. In that, like, certain choices you make in dialogue will it'll tell you like your character is now this trait, and that'll come to play in future um, interactions. Uh, if you you know were trying to be charismatic and swoon this girl on the train, then you'll become sort of the romantic, and uh, you'll do better in those situations in the future. And that's that's really neat too. You're you're also, even though he's a character out of a book, you get to influence his. Uh, his entire personality throughout your personal run of the game. Mm-hmm. And and there's so many moving parts and flags upon flags upon flags. Like <laughs> it's hard to tell what exactly is being influenced, but I would not be yeah. surprised if it was, you know, the reason why I saw the things that I saw was because two towns ago, I did something <laughs> that made my guy a little bit more lecherous. Right. You know, um, really, really impressive shit. And even if not, like I said before, if, the fact that it instills that feeling in us yes. is almost as good. Yes. That feeling of complexity is really, really important. Yeah. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Cool game, man. I, I, I'm i glad this one came up. Um, I believe it's been recommended on Slack um, a couple times, but I don't particularly remember by who. And uh, and the fact that it's kind of just uh, had all this praise anyway. I apologize to anyone who's specifically pointed it out to us, but um, I'm glad we got around to it and hope you have enjoyed our our look at it as well yeah um you know we we do new and old stuff even though the things we're doing next episode are more uh, skew new um yeah yeah so uh thank you guys very much for listening um this is a slightly shorter episode than most but uh, we did not expect the howler to be quite as slight as maybe it was um we're still looking for suggestions for uh both meaty games and uh short arcade games especially those because they're so easy to just fit in with something we want to do that's on a grand yeah, so we want to so. actually beat um Oh yeah, real quick, uh, just because this is the the place for it. Um, yeah. We never do follow up on the show, but I actually did follow through and beat uh, Neon Struct, and nice. uh, it's good. It, it gets uh, it's it's shorter than I thought it was going to be based on where I was at. I was closer to the end, um, and it is a, a real cool little like parable about uh, surveillance states, and uh, I ended up really really enjoying it. So uh, we recommend it on the episode, but still play it. I went back and listened to the soundtrack more because it's it's really great. good. I, I like that. Uh, the home conversion is the name of that band. And I like them yeah. a lot. Yeah. What's the cave living cave living is good. Are you trying to break my heart? Is so yeah. good. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Good yeah it's good stuff. <laughs> that, that band is really good. Um, yeah. So uh, everyone, somebody once asked us uh, on the Slack, they're like, do you guys ever go back and play the games that you guys do a little bit of and say you want to go back and play? And the answer is a lot of times no. Uh, but sometimes, <laughs> sometimes, you know, we do. And I, I wanted to make a point of beating uh, Neon Struct because I liked it so much. Yeah. Um, and it is, uh, it is very good. Yeah. There, there's certainly been some that I've played a, a significant bit more, but yeah. Uh, so someday we'll do a, is... like next time we do, maybe before the end of the year, we can do like a revisit episode, like go yeah. back through our list of things, pick out a game that we started, but never beat, choose to beat it and then go back and cover kind of book report. Like we both do. Totally. One. Or yeah, even just looking through our, uh, I think we did this last time, but just kind of looking through our, uh, what we have and, uh, and, talking about what didn't get covered in the show that we continue to play yeah so. yeah. yeah the year end wrap up um we've done a little bit of that but uh making a point of it would definitely be a good thing yeah um yeah so if you like this show uh, you can support us financially on patreon if you go to patreon.com forward slash duck feed tv uh that is the best and uh, most direct way to support the the show and the entire network right and doing so will get you access to our slack channel at certain level and also um special episodes uh, of shows that we are bringing on and the more people we get to uh, on the patreon the more shows we're going to be doing as well so there's some cool stuff coming up yes um on there is has uh has the x-men podcast been officialized yet uh not yet uh, um we keep we're hovering we're trending upwards while kind of hovering up and down right. like the highest we were like at three 
3,310, which is 190 away. I think right now we're about uh, 27 or 230 away. So it kind of goes up and down a little bit, but trending upwards. I think we'll get there uh, hopefully by the end of the summer. Good, because so. because uh, the preview episode of that's really good, and uh, and J- Jeremy Greer is a great guy, and I hope you guys get to do that show soon. Yeah, Jeremy's wonderful. Jeremy is great. Uh, yeah, I love him. Um, yeah, so uh, thank you guys very much for that. Uh, if you don't want to support us on Patreon, you can also rate and review the show on iTunes. Mm-hmm. Um, that is very helpful. If you have any suggestions to make, you can come find us on Facebook.com slash check it out, Comrade, or on Twitter at Comrade Podcast and uh, the contact form on duck- duckfeed.tv, all of which uh, we will look at and add to our list and uh, possibly pick up sometime soon. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, so until next time, uh, thank you and good night. Night.